and welcome back. We're gonna get into some more advanced tags and probably the most important tag that you'll use other than the ones that we've covered so far are tags that we need to create forms. As you know, when you go to websites, usually there's some sort of a login or registration form. So we're gonna build that out today. To get started, let's uh, just create a new file here. We'll save it and call it register.html on our desktop. Perfect, and we know that we want an HTML, so we use our little shortcut and we'll title it register, save that. And now in the index.html file, let's add another link that references register.html and it'll just say here register. All right, we'll save both of these files and let's refresh. We have register, click register. Well, we have nothing yet, but it looks like it's working. Let's uh, add this on a new line just because it looks prettier that way. So to do that, if you remember, we're gonna add a break tag. So let's refresh. There you go. We have new page and register. Okay, so let's build out this form. If we go into register.html, the way we write forms in HTML, well, conveniently, there's a form tag. Okay, but this form tag itself, it needs to have the actual form inside of it. So what kind of form elements do we have? Well, again, if we remember our good old friend, W3C, let's type in forms. And we can see over here that we have HTML forms and refresh, uh, we'll make that full screen and you can see over here that there's a ton of information on it, but you can look that up yourself for now. I'm going to introduce you to the most common ones, probably the ones that you'll use 90% of the time. The first one, as we do with any form, and let's go to that page for now, is, well, we wanna enter our name. So how do we do that? We have a input tag that has a type of text because, well, our name will be in text form. And we can close that off. And it's actually a self-closing tag. So now if I save and refresh, okay, we have a little box here. Hopefully you can see that. But, well, we should probably title it because we won't know what to enter that way. So we're gonna put in here, we're gonna say first name, semicolon and save. Let's refresh. We have first name. And now let's make this a little bit bigger. There you go. Now you can enter your name in here. Awesome. Let's add another one for our last name. And again, we'll have our input type. So that's an attribute and a value of text. And if we refresh, we have last name. Okay, but it kind of looks ugly. Remember that HTML just reads line by line and doesn't really know that we want a space here. So again, we can add a break tag here and refresh and we have first name and last name. Okay, that's, that's fairly self-explanatory. Now, what else do we have in a form? We have email. So let's add another field, which is email. And we'll do input, again, type equals text. We'll add another break here because we're gonna need that spacing. And let's save, refresh, awesome. Okay, so we have our general registration form. And obviously with any form, we need some sort of buttons, right? Like we need to submit this somewhere so we can register. Well, again, there's a nice input type for that. So we do input, instead of a text type, there is a submit type. So this, if we add another break in here, and I save this, I refresh, it has a submit button now. Now, where did this submit come from? Well. 
When you put in input type submit, it automatically creates a button. And if you don't specify what to say, it'll just have this text, but we can change that. So we can put value and we'll put register. Save that, refresh. We now have a register button. Okay, but what if we make uh, mistakes in this field? We write stuff and we want to reset this form. Again, there's a, another input for that. And the type of that input, as you can imagine, is reset. So now if we close this, add another break in here. Actually, we can keep that on the same line. We'll save, refresh. And we have reset. So now if I type in anything in here and let's say I don't like this, I need to reset the form. I can just click reset and it clears everything for us. Okay. You may be asking yourself what happens when we click register before we get into that, I want to just go through the common input types and then we'll click register to see what happens with the email. We ideally want, first of all, for it to be required so that when you click register, if you haven't provided an email, it won't let you register. And there's an attribute that we can use for that. And that is required. And here we don't actually have to specify a value because automatically it's assumed that required equals to true, which means that this form field is required. So if I save that, I refresh and I leave it blank and I click register, we'll say, please fill out this field. Now, we also want to make sure that it's an appropriate email field. So if I type something like this, we still want to make sure that, you know, this is an incorrect email, we don't want to register. So the input type of text that I told you for email is actually wrong. There's a specific one that we can use, which is, as you can imagine, email. So now if I refresh and type in something that's not an email, and I click register. I'll say, please include an app in the email address. Very nice. It's kind of like magic. It does this for you, which is very, very nice. Let's expand on our knowledge of inputs and add a few more fields that we'll most likely need. We usually want to know somebody's birthday. So let's add birthday here. And for this input type, let's do type date. So if I save this and I refresh, look at that. We have a nice little date picker. So I can pick anything in here. All right, what else do we need? We also need gender. So we'll do input type. And for gender, well, there's no specific input type for gender, but there is something called radio. And radio is, as the name suggests, radio buttons. So now I click refresh and well, I have one radio button, but we ideally want to have options, right? So how do we do that? So for the radio, we also need to say whether it's male or female. Let's have within the gender, we're going to have a break over here in the line. And we'll say input type radio. And we'll say male. And we also want female. And we also want other. And when we refresh this, we have male, female and other. But you see a problem here, I just click the radio buttons and I can't deselect them. And ideally, you should only be able to select one. And right now, the way the radio buttons are, they don't know of each other's existence. We want to make sure that they know that they're connected. They're family and only one of them can be picked. So how do we do that? The way we do that is through the name attribute. So for the name, we'll say gender. And this name attribute needs to match on all the radio buttons so that they know they are together. They're part of the gender input field. So if I save here and refresh, now you can see that I can only select one. 
Perfect. Uh, what else should we have? Well, let's say I really want to know if you have pets. So with pets, we're going to have input type. Well, you we can have multiple pets. So it won't be radio buttons. We want checkbox. So checkbox, we want it to have cats or let's just put cat and we want to have can type today checkbox and we want to have dogs so let's save that let's refresh and look at that we have pets but this time it's checkboxes which means I can select multiple I want to introduce you to one last form element and it's actually not an input with a type as we've described before it's a little bit different but the idea is still the same so let's add cars here and we want this to be a drop down menu again something that we see very often in form fields however unlike an input tag we have to do a select tag closing select tag as well and within here we can put in our options so the option will be we'll have a value of Volvo and we'll say Volvo because we want that actually printed to the screen and again we have to close that tag we'll add Audi and we'll close that tag as well and we can keep adding them that but for now just two is fine if I save this and I refresh we have cars let's add a break here just so it looks nicer there you go and here now we have a drop down menu let's say you want to extend this or you want to see what kind of properties you can put with select the way you go about it as you know we've done this before we type in HTML select tag and actually Google gives you a nice little info page over here with attributes so you can see over here we can use multiple which is specifies that multiple options can be selected at once so let's do that let's minimize this perfect and within select we'll put multiple we refresh and we can actually select multiple elements but that doesn't look that pretty so I'm gonna take that out and refresh I actually realized that we forgot one important input type so I'm gonna throw it in there as a bonus and as you know with any registration form we want a password so let's add that right after the email we'll do input type and yes there's a password type that we can add and this password type will have another attribute that's kind of cool and that is min which is the minimum characters that a password needs okay so let's save that refresh and let's add a break here so it looks pretty refresh and now the password field look at that it acts like a password field all right let's submit this form and see what happens okay okay Andre can we finally submit this form all right and in this video we'll finally see what happens when we submit this form but there is one last thing that we need to include and that is the name attributes and then I'll explain towards the end of this video why we need those so we want to add in each one of our fields a name attribute so this one will be first name and I'm just going to copy and paste here just so it'll be a little bit faster we have last name email password birthday we already have these for the radio buttons which is good and we need here cat dog Volvo Volvo 
Okay, and we don't need it for the buns because, well, there's no user information there. So I'm going to save that and I'm gonna make this full screen so you can see. I'm gonna refresh the page and let's enter some fake data and see what happens. So I'm gonna say fake man, email address is fake, password would be one, two, three, birthday will be male with a cat and has an Audi. I'm going to click register now, but keep an eye out up over here to see what happens when I click. Did you catch that? Let's copy this because when I clicked register, this got attached. I'm gonna minimize this and print this out here so we can see it for ourselves. First, we have a question mark, then first name, fake. That's exactly what we entered. We have last name, man. Email is fake something something gmail.com. Password, one, two, three. Uh oh, they know our password. Birthday, gender, and cat on. We didn't select Volvo. I'm not sure why, I'll take a look at that later. But you can see over here that the, value that, the values that we entered into our form were just attached to this link. And this is actually called query strings. And what it is, it's one way for us to send our information to the backend or the servers because we have to store this form information somewhere so that when we come back onto this page, the website remembers us. This was automatically generated in HTML5 with a form, but form was using an attribute called get. And this get, if I left it as this, will do the exact same thing. It will attach the form information to the URL and send it to the server. There is another option where you can do post and you can try it on your own here, but you wouldn't see any query parameters. So this wouldn't change the bar or the top won't change. And that is because it will be attached to the body of the request, which we'll get into when we get to that section. I don't wanna confuse you too much, but you can see the difference here of why we might wanna use post instead of get because, well, what if somebody was over my shoulder and they can see my password right there in the bar? I just wanted you to get comfortable with the idea that we are sending this information to the back end. The way we handle that, we'll get into later on in the course. Right now, we're just focusing on the front end. The last thing I want to show you was that form also has a action attribute, which used to get used a lot. If you saw old PHP based websites, they'll have some sort of a action.php, which said, submit this form. And when you submit this form to the back end, to the server, run this script, this file that's on the server. But there are better ways of doing this now, so I'll show that later on in the course. Let's take a look at this. So we have a question mark, and this is the standard. Anytime there's a query string, so we're adding a piece of data to our URL, it starts off with a question mark which states, hey, coming up, we're going to have a bunch of data for you. The first one is first name, which again corresponds with the name that we have in our form. And that was equal to fake. So that's property and value. So you can think of name as property and the value as man. So last name, first name. You can see here that there's an and sign. So that's again saying first name equals to fake and last name equals to man, and email equals to fake, some gibberish, gmail.com. This is because of something called URL encoding. And because the URL has special meaning for some characters, such as this and the question mark, it encodes the at sign with something that it understands, but it won't affect its encoding. We have password123, birthday, gender on and cat on. And I've actually realized why the Volvo and Audi information didn't register. And that is because for 
the query string to work, as you can see, it needs to have a name associated with a value. So we have first name and fake. If we look at the radio buttons, we have a name, which is gender, and we have on. So you see over here how we didn't send any value. We know that the gender, some button was clicked in the gender, so it's on, but we don't know which value. And that is because we should have included a value for the male so that if that's the one that's selected, a value will be sent. And finally, value. And now same with the select. We should have had our name of the select field be cars. So that now the name can be associated with the value. So let's give that a try one more time. I'm going to delete this. I'm going to save the changes that we just made. I'm going to make this full screen. Let's refresh and enter some new information. Fake, new, email is newfake at gmail.com. Password is 1234 this time. Birthday, let's do female, dog, and Audi. I'm going to click register. And let's see what we have here. We have first name fake, last name is new, email, new fake at gmail.com, password 1234, birthday, gender is female, good, dog is on. Okay, so we've selected dog, that's great. And then cars is Audi. There you go. And that's as complicated as forms are going to get. You'll encounter this a lot and there is definitely in most websites that you build, whether it's a landing page, a website that requires registration, this is something that you'll see a lot. Once you understand this, once it makes sense, you can call yourself an HTML developer. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome back. I'm excited to show you a few more tags before we get into some fun things that we can do with HTML now and we can finish up the course. You may be wondering, hey, what if maybe I'm working with a team and we're all working on the same HTML file and I want to maybe have a comment in there to let them know that maybe here, use get, not post. Let's capitalize that. If we just do this the way it is, it's going to show up on the website. We just want it as a comment so that people who look at the code can see it without affecting the website. Well, HTML has a way to comment. And the way you do that is like this. Greater than sign, exclamation mark, dash, dash. And then same on the other side without the exclamation mark. Now, that's kind of tedious to write. In Sublime Text, you can do that by holding Command slash. So Command slash, and you can do it that way. And if you have a Windows-based laptop or computer, and that is the Windows key and slash. So that's how we write comments. And if I save this and refresh, nothing shows up. Perfect. And then the last two tags that I'm going to show you are the div tags for division and the span tags. These tags are, how can I say this, useless right now. And it's because they're used to divide content. So div, you're going to see in a lot of web pages, are used like this to, let's say, wrap the form. So by doing this, let's see if it does anything. Nope, everything looks the exact same. But this is very powerful when we get into CSS because what this allows us to do is to divide up our content. Imagine if we had a registration form here, maybe another piece of content, maybe an image up here. Div allows us to add styles and divide up the content into each different section so that each section of our website 
can have its own little box. So you're, you're gonna see this a lot in the CSS section, but for now, just keep that in mind so there's no surprises. Span is the same thing, except span is a inline element. So an inline element is different from a block element because with span, we can just add it to a specific line. So we can do span and span. And again, this won't do anything. If I refresh, nothing happens. But now, in line, we can add some styles only to the first name, and we can emphasize it. So these are just tags that we can use as tools when we want to have a container, an invisible container around a piece of element in our HTML that perhaps we want to add some style to or have some specific functionality to. So again, we're not going to worry about adding these to our current website, but I wanted to show you that those do exist and we're going to encounter those in the CSS chapter. That's it for now. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Wow, good job for still hanging in there. It only gets more and more exciting from here. We're just scratching the surface with the power that comes with being a web developer. But I want to quickly talk about HTML versus HTML5. I've mentioned this topic a few times, but just kind of brushed it off and told you, yeah, this is HTML, yeah, this is HTML5, but I wanted to just take a break and quickly go over the basic concept of what HTML5 is. If you remember in our diagram, HTML, when it first got started in 1989 to 1991, it wasn't as elaborate. It didn't have as many features as it has now. We want to make sure that all these browsers play nicely and understand our HTML rules. So if you remember our friend Tim, our first web developer, the guy who created the World Wide Web, has a governing body that establishes what HTML should look like so that these individual browsers can know how to code their browsers so that it reads HTML properly. And obviously the web that we had in the 90s is very different than the one that we have now. So there's a lot of new things that we need to update. And some of those things are phones and we have tablets. And just overall, we need more power from HTML. So HTML5 was the evolution and there were many, many evolutions of HTML. HTML5 is the latest one where we try to add on features so that we can improve the user experience. Now, what are some of those features? Let's take a quick look at our good old friend, W3Schools. One of the things that HTML5 wants to do is we want to make sure that it doesn't affect any old website. If you remember our very first website from Tim, maybe in 1991, well, that still works to this day. We visited it in the previous videos. You can still visit websites from the 90s because we wanna make sure that everything is backwards compatible. That's a fancy way of saying older versions are not obsolete. But we also wanna tack on these features. And you can read on the website all the information of HTML5 and what it does and some of the things that it supports. And it does get a little technical and we don't need to get into it too much. But the one thing that I wanna emphasize that it introduced this idea of semantic elements. And what that means is they wanted to make websites more descriptive. Search engines such as Google go on websites and they use these things called crawlers to look through your website, these machines that are reading your HTML to understand what your website is, what the topic about it is, so that they could rank it in search engines. And HTML5 semantic elements tries to add a little bit more meaning for these robots so that when they encounter something, it makes a little bit more sense. So this is an example of some of these new tags that HTML5 introduced. And let's show you a few of them. So for example, if we wanted to comment this out, we know how to do that already. And a semantic element would maybe look like header 
where we have the title h1, which is register. And we close the header so that now the crawler knows that this is our header. And maybe we have some navigation links. So now we can have a tags with our href and we'll just say that it links to Google. And then we close the nav. We only have one navigation link for now, but I just want to demonstrate quickly. And finally, we have a footer. So within the footer, we can add something like website made with love. And you can see over here that this, even to a machine, if it understands what header means and nav means and footer means, gives a lot more meaning to the web page and it'll have a better idea of how the website is structured and where it should rank in their Google search results. You can take your time and read through some of these tags and I do recommend that you visit this website and go through some of the HTML intro. You'll even see that if we click on input types, so something that we visited already and we scroll to some of the attributes, you'll see that there's some new HTML5, they have these little icon over here that have been introduced. So we're constantly expanding to make HTML better and better functionality. You can see here min, for example, we use that for password if you remember specifies the minimum value for an input field. So if I set a min over here, then it makes sure that I enter the minimum amount of value. But again, you can take a look at it yourself. The issue with semantic web is that it's still fairly new. So you won't see as much of this. You will on some websites, but it's very hard to prove that it actually has good SEO performance because it's still fairly early. But just so you don't get surprised and you're aware of what's happening, it is something that you might encounter. But overall, HTML5 tries to improve the performance of the web because we're constantly evolving. And just like websites need to go from simple HTML text-based websites to massive websites like Twitter that you can post and talk to millions of people around the world where we need our web technologies to evolve with us. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Good afternoon to you, not just Andre. This is a fun little video. I like to throw some of these every once in a while because I know it can get very exhausting when you have a lot of information thrown at you. So I want us to copy a website really, really fast. Let's look at how we can do that. One of my favorite websites is Wait But Why. Ooh, it all caps, I don't know why I did that, but it should still work. If you haven't checked out this website, I highly recommend it, some great, great articles on here. But let's say I look at this website and I'm like, hmm, this is really, really cool. I wish I could play around with it. Well, before I showed you view, developer, and developer tools, and we had a nice little pop-up at the bottom of the screen. This time I wanna show you view source. When you click on that, oh boy, you get a whole bunch of stuff. But if you look at the top over here, you see that it's doc type HTML, it's just simple HTML. And this might look really, really overwhelming. Don't worry, this will make sense to you at the end, but you can see over here that they're commenting this out. There's the HTML tag, and if you scroll down, there's a whole lot of stuff. But simply by copying all this, so I can just select all and copy this, and if I open up Sublime, there you go, and let's just open up a new file over here and paste this. Ooh, that's a lot of stuff. I'm gonna save, let's save as, and we'll call it wait but why, HTML, all right, save it. And now, if I go to my desktop, and I have wait by why HTML, if I drag it into my Google Chrome, 
look at that. I have a weight by Y all to myself. And I can play around with it and break it and do whatever I want. I can even see what they use to create these little post thingadingies. But a really, really fun way to play around with websites. Hope that was interesting. See you in the next one. Bye-bye. Phew. Can you believe you've made it this far? I mean, at the beginning of this, you probably had no idea what any of this means. And now, look at you. You know what every single line means. And you know what? This is pretty much it for HTML. It's not very hard. You just have to remember a few tags. And it's very easy to test around and play. So call yourself an HTML developer. I have a fun little game for you. As you can see over here, we've created a simple web page where I can link to another page, I can go back, I can even click on register and submit a form. I want you to try your hand at building your own little website here. And once you're done, I'll provide the link to my email in the description below. Send me your first website and I'll showcase some of my favorite ones in an upcoming video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.